So it's not enough to just connect to a database uh, and be able to send statements as we saw. We have to have a security mindset and of all the things I can think of um, security related other than possibly just encrypting your you know, transmissions over HTTP or something, uh, this is by far probably the most prevalent, the most important, not to be overlooked. And I wanna build it in to the discussion before we go any further. So we've learned that we can create a connection. We've learned that we use statements uh, over those connections to send individual SQL statements. And now right off the bat, without even going any further, we're gonna look at how we create those statements in a safe way because of something uh, called SQL injection. Uh, this is an extremely prevalent form of malicious attack against software. The basic idea here is that, you know, uh, hackers or people who, you know, mean you harm or want some benefit for themselves can basically uh, create injected code. In this, in this case, it's specifically SQL statements that they're injecting um, by using like forms and, and any interface they have on the web that lets them enter in information. So the easiest way to conceptualize this is think of your standard web um, form that has a search. Say you're looking at the user um, directory for Marist or for anywhere, right? And you have a box there where you can search by name, right? So you have um, a form and it says, you know, search and you put, I want to search for Brian. So you type in Brian and you hit enter and behind the scenes, right? Now we know that that application the client side JavaScript is sending, or or the the actual form submission is HTTP. But at some point, it's being submitted back to the application server. The application server says they want to search for Brian. The application server then creates a SQL statement, select star from name where first name is like Brian, and then it queries the database. The database returns all of the tuples that match. Right? We've seen that work. We do this conversion that we talked about from, you know, the SQL tuple to our data object. So, you know, maybe we have an actual user object that we populate with all the rest of the user information. And then we pass that back to the client that displays it on the screen. Now, where this goes wrong is, and I'll show you the specifics of how you can do this, if you don't catch all the special characters and SQL specific things, I can search for a lot more than I was supposed to be able to, or I can do something far worse like drop a table or delete a database or a whole bunch of other bad stuff. And the way that I do that is basically by using the SQL syntax to end the statement for you. So you put like Brian and then you put a single quote to end the start because I know it's a string. So it's going to have single quotes around it when it creates the SQL statement. So I put Brian end quote semicolon to like end the statement and then put a new statement in like drop table users. Right. And it's going to drop the table assuming that I got the name right. Um, and in a nutshell, in its most raw form, that's what SQL injection is. And we'll look at more specific examples, but that's an overview. And there's all different ways you can do this. It's actually not just in a user form like that. It actually is done very commonly by manipulating the URL at the top of the browser. Because if you look at those, like when you're shopping on Amazon, right, you have that long query string. Uh, you know, and it might say like where item ID equals and it has some hash of the item number and, you know, maybe some search parameters are up there too. You've maybe, I know I have done this in your own life where you're like, oh, well, I, I see what they're doing up there. I can just alter this, this one thing to change the search, right? Like maybe I know the name of another item and I just want to display it. So you change the name and then poof, up comes another item. Or you're just curious. You're like, okay, this is item ID, you know. 367, what happens, what's item 368? So you type it in and you change it and boom, you get some random item, right? Um, not particularly useful, but it is another form of SQL injection, right? So we'll talk more about that. Um, there's also second order SQL injection. Um, it's, you know, we'll talk more about that when we get there. That one's a little bit more complex, um, but this is what we want to prevent. 
before we can prevent it, we have to just thoroughly know what it is. So that's what we're diving into first. So here's some of those examples that I was talking about before. Um, in this case, we're searching for a username, not the first name, like I said before. But you can see, like, um, if I wanted to search for a username, it creates a statement like this, right? Select star from users, where name equals, um, and the username. Now, uh, the username in this case is being kind of uh, concatenated in as the variable from the programming language, right? So you can imagine that the programming language uh, received the request from the client. So we're on the application tier now. Uh, it said, okay, I got to query, you know, I got to create that statement. So this is what it's doing. And to create the statement, this should honestly be where name like um, would be a better one. But I guess this is looking for a specific username. So that's fine too. So this is looking for a specific username. Um, not really a, a search. Um, and, you know, I have this username variable, which was the information returned to me from the client, and I'm going to dynamically put that into the statement, right? That's what's happening here. We're concatenating in that dynamic piece that came from the user interface. Maybe in this case, a better example of this case than a search is that I had the list of users in front of me, and I clicked on a particular name in the list, and now I want to see all the information on that user. Right, so it's moving from that search um, result screen to the details of a specific user because I clicked on one. And when I clicked on myself, say I clicked on my username, say it's B Gormanly, I click on that, the client sends B Gormanly back as the thing I clicked on to the server. The server's application code has that in this username variable and creates the dynamic select statement based on that. So I get select star from users where name equals B Gormanly. Now, what if I put, um, I had a search box like we said before, and I put, as I said before, B Gormanly, and then I did something like this where one equals one, or I had that drop tables thing. The answer is, is it's going to create a SQL statement like what's at the bottom there. So depending on what the availability is, now obviously the clicking example isn't a great uh, one for this because in clicking, I don't really have the ability to add more text, right? But in a search box, I do. So, um, you know, just we'll, let's stick with the search box, even though it didn't exactly fit that that previous SQL query directly um, because it, it gives us, you know, we can type whatever we want in. So in this case, you know, um, select name from users where name equals, and I'm just going to close a single quote, so I don't care, it's just empty, it's obviously not going to equal anything, but I put this or there where one equals one. And notice I left off the other single quote at the end because I know that the SQL statement itself is going to add that. In fact, you can see it here. So see this single quote over here? Um, that is the statement being created, and here's the opening one here and the closing one here. And then this double quote is the concatenation along with the plus. So this ends the string, the plus concatenates in the variable, this plus now says I'm going to concatenate something else, this quote says it's a string, and then inside I have the single quote, the semicolon, etc. And the end result, if I put this in that search box, is that I end up with this SQL statement. And now instead of getting a very specific user with a very specific username, I'm actually going to get all of them because I've ordered it with one equals one, which is always true, right? And you're like, that's a true statement. So it doesn't matter about the first where clause because the second where clause it's ordered with is true. So I get all the user data. I get to see every record. Um, another example here, this is the one that has the drop tables in it. So here I'm looking for a specific user ID. Um, but if I put into the input one semicolon drop table users, we could end up with a statement like you see in the bottom, which would be really detrimental because, yeah, sure, we, we the first select statement is going to return the, the right user. And then immediately after the entire table is going to be dropped. Well, confusingly enough, sorry, this example has user info on the one side and users on the second. So I should update that slide. Um, Maybe user info is a different table, so it, it doesn't, it's not really terribly relevant. But what is relevant here is that drop table users is going to drop a table called users if it exists. So maybe I got the name wrong, who knows? Um, by the way, that's one of the interesting things to look for and why logging is so important. In your application, if you have a monitoring uh, system for your logs, you should be looking at your logs for stuff like this because 
commonly when people are trying to do SQL injection, they don't know what your table names are right off the bat. They're trying to figure it out. Um, so it's a little bit of poking around to see what they get. And if you start getting errors in your logs because, you know, the input doesn't make sense and the application throws errors and these things are in the logs, if you look for them, it gives you a clue that, hey, somebody's trying to, to you know, affect you with SQL injection. Um, two things. One is you might want to stop them or, you know, like shut down the application or whatever um, because, you know, it's hard to figure out which client it is unless it has the IP address there, which would be awesome. Um, and two, you need to fix the problem, right, which we're going to talk more about. So uh, it's good to know that this stuff is happening. Uh, blind SQL injection talked about this a little bit. This is that idea, like I said before, that it's not always about like a form. Uh, it could be that you're manipulating a URL. So, you know, specifically the parameters in the URL too. Um, you can do things up there as well where, um, you know, if you look at the URL um, and the way it's formatted, you can tell what the application is using those parameters for on the back end. They're using those parameters to create the SQL statement. And if you manipulate them the right way, then um, you can still end up with the same results. So that's blind SQL injection. Second order SQL injection is a little bit more interesting. Um, I like using a forum as an example for this because it's, it's an example of, of where someone might use it. But the idea here is that you're actually going to submit data into the database that contains malicious commands. And when that data is then retrieved from the database to be shown, it's going to run it for every user. So maybe you want to, I mean, this is like a weird um, example, but it's, it's one I can think of off the top of my head. Maybe you want to um, go on a forum and have it like basically query for everybody's super secret information in their profile um, and send it to you or something every time they read a post. So you write this post and into the post, you write it in such a way that there's embedded code in there that's going to be saved into the database so that when they look at the thread, it's going to be rendered, that, that same information is going to be pulled out of the database to be shown on, on the the next user screen and basically run that script. And that script might be to look up their user record because they're the ones logged in. It'll have their user ID. Um, so you could parameterize user ID into that if you knew that that's what it was. And then it will get their data and then maybe you have, <coughs> excuse me, some embedded JavaScript in there or something that, that sends it to your um, IP address or whatever, which obviously would be uh, one easy way for them to find you. But, you know, that be what it may, um, it would still get the job done. So, and maybe you have some, you know, DNS trickery or whatever. But that's the basic idea here is that you're actually going to embed the SQL injection into the SQL and it's going to be saved so that every time the application pulls that SQL out to run it, it gets reapplied every single time. Doing this requires a lot of knowledge about how the database is set up generally. It's kind of hard to just guess this stuff, but it is possible, and it's also not easy to detect. So you don't hear about this as much, but it's important to kind of point out. It's, it's another form of SQL injection. So what do we do? So what is this magic silver bullet that I want to tell you about? So and I want you to use, which is why I'm doing this right off the bat. It's called prepared statements. So basically what this is, is when you are creating those statements uh, in your application, uh, programming language, and you are sending them to the database. Instead of sending them raw, we parameterize them with prepared statements. And what that basically does is it creates a placeholder in the actual SQL statement that we then fill, and that database driver that we're using, that CLI, will actually um, ensure that, because we're using this parameterized method, that the input is clean for that particular database on that language. Um, it will make sure that they don't close uh, the SQL statement with a single quote, um, and then you know use a semicolon, and then add another statement, things like that. So it ensures that every statement is free of those dangerous pieces. Um, there are other ways you can do this, of course, and I'm not gonna like spend too much time on the first one here because it's not the scope of this course, but it is worth uh, mentioning. Um, you can pattern check, right? So you can obviously look to see what 
parameters are being filled out in the form, say in the JavaScript side or on your logic side uh, for your application on your server side, uh, you can check the input there too before you create um, the prepared statement. Maybe you're expecting an integer and somebody sent you, you know, a string or something. Why, why not check that? Don't just assume and create strings out of everything. Um, you know, double check. Does this match what I expect? If, if you ask them to enter a phone number and you get some text, that's a red flag, right? Um, and then within the text, you can look for the single quotes and whatever yourself as well. Um, looking for things like escape characters that have a meaning in, in SQL. Um, again, most of this is why we use prepared statements, but you can do it yourself as well. Another big thing you can do, and this is important for us, is database permissions. And I talked about this in a previous video. This is that idea that we only give the permission that's required to get the job done. We don't give any additional permission for any additional reason ever. Like, it's just don't do it. Like that was the social security example I gave, right? Like you don't have a reason uh, for that database user for that application to have access to the social security numbers. They shouldn't just limit it away. Um, that's the easiest way to do it because then anyone doing SQL injection or anything else can't get to that information through the application. It's actually impossible for them to do it. They'd have to get to the database themselves. So that is another prevalent way to do it. So let's look a little bit more in depth at now how we actually use prepared statement. We saw how to use a general statement. Now let's just see the simple tweak we do, and it really is simple. This is easy to do, um, and it could literally be the difference between like you losing and, and having a job one day because um, you know you definitely don't want to be the victim of an attack like this. So I have the connection string up there. Um, not much else has pa uh, changed there. Uh, we have the user and the password. Again, not much else has changed. Um, the author here is just the value that we're imagining is maybe getting passed in um, from the application. Now, in this case, like this first example, this is what we had before, right? We're just going to insert this record. So we insert into authors, particularly into an attribute called name, the value, and then we have a question mark. So that's that parameterized piece. We haven't said what that name is going to be yet, um, but we've just put a question mark there. That's it. That's the SQL string. It's no longer concatenating in directly the author here. Before we would have taken this, right? And we would have ended our string here. We would have put a plus. We would have put author here. We would have put another plus, And we would have started the string again and ended this last bit, right? With the, the close parenthesis, the double quote, and the semicolon. Uh, now, instead, we're just replacing all that extra work with a question mark. That's it. Now, when I have the dot, dot, dot here because I didn't include the try statement and all that, um, but uh, you would probably now put this into a try catch. Um, but inside, where it's important, is that we have our connection we create, and we still create it the same way that we did before. Um, but this time, instead of just creating a statement, we create a prepared statement. And the prepared statement, we pass the SQL. Okay, straightforward enough. That's pretty much exactly what we did before with the statement, except now with the prepared statement, we also, for each question mark, now there's only one here, but if there was more than one, you would set more than one of these parameters. Uh, you set, um, the, this denotes that it's the first parameter and the value that you want to, to have. So if there was more than one question mark, you would have another one of these with a two and the value that you want to put in the place of the second question mark. This one will say, for the first question mark, I'm going to replace it with author. So this will be replaced with this, just like we were doing with the concatenation before, but you just need this extra line of code. And to be honest, I think it's a little bit cleaner than that concatenation anyway, um, regardless of the safety factors. And now the CLI is going to evaluate that this is a safe thing to do before it does it, right? And then you execute um, the update, which is just how you perform an update. Um, and tell it to actually do the prepared statement. And that's it. So here's the prepared statement, you execute it, and that would be the end of it. So, and you can do this for all types of statements, whether inserts, um, you know, updates, deletes, selects, whatever it is, um, prepared statements always can work. So please use this and please use this all the time.